So I'm Gary Manning, I'm TA lead at King. Um, I'll uh, explain a little bit about uh, who we are and what we do. What I want to talk to you about is a bit around cultural hiring and how we do it. Doesn't mean that this is how you should do it, but just want to give you some ideas on how I think you could take away a few things here. It's, it's low cost, you don't, it doesn't have to cost any money to do this. Um, so hopefully that will be quite useful for people here. So I'll explain how we do it at King. Um, how we make decisions based around the capability versus the kind of team cultural fit. Um, talk a bit about unconscious bias. I think it's really important that we're kind of aware of this. Um, I'm sure most people are aware of what unconscious bias is, but hopefully give you a few kind of pointers if you want to start talking about it and getting people more involved and understanding what it is. Um, and then thinking about how you can take some of this away um, and implement it. So King or Activision Blizzard, King as some people refer to us, we make, we make games. The games that people know most about King is Candy Crush or um, Stella the Witch up there from Bubble Witch Saga or Farm Heroes we create in, in London, but some other big names there like you know, everyone's heard of Call of Duty, so that's, that's who we are. Um, and just explain kind of how we run our recruitment process. We start off with our kickoff, which is like taking your brief, it's a really good, maybe up to an hour session depending on if it's a new role or not. Um, new roles take a lot longer. We have a really thorough brief so that we know we're going to get it right from the start. We go into sourcing like most people do. Um, we do an interview briefing so the people that are part of the interview panel, we want to make sure that they really know what we're looking for and that is helping them understand if they're going to cover some values or some capability, what they're expected to do because it's going to be really important because later on we're going to ask them to come to this wash up and our wash up is all of the interviewers, if possible, come back and discuss the feedback on the one candidate, the three, four, five candidates that have been through this process and did we get it right? And so if we got the kickoff right and we had an interview briefing, then hopefully at the end of that we would have found the right candidate and everyone can provide feedback in the right way for us. Um, I like to stick in a health check a couple of weeks after we've kicked off a role, get the team to double check that we're still on track or off track. And if we're off track, how do we, how do we uh, get back on track? And then standard offer um, and onboarding. So if we're talking about cultural fit, um, for me, we're talking about our values and do people buy into our values and do they think the same way? So we're not trying to uh, hire clones, we're trying to get people who share in our purpose and our values and doing things in the way that we think they should be done. So this is what we say, it's what we believe, it's how we behave. So it says there, can you name them? I'm not going to get a name, I stole this slide from our interview training. These are our, our values. So what we have are these five values and then we have a definition of what those should be. Um, so when we're hiring, we ask people to find out whether we think people identify with those values, do they um, display behaviours that are going to fit with what we're, what we're looking for. Um, but then you need to be able to make the right decision. So thinking about those values, someone's gone through the interview process, we need to make sure we, we can identify that. And what we do is we talk about this probing, and I'll show you a little kind of methodology that we use in a second. So the behaviours that people display are the things that you can see. So if you meet someone and they seem quite gregarious and they're comfortable and you can kind of start seeing, seeing their, their persona, but actually what you want to understand is what's driving those behaviours and will those behaviours suit the company that you're in once they're here. So we need to kind of delve deeper and under the surface, hence the iceberg. Um, so what are their beliefs and values and do they, do they understand what their purpose is and their capabilities? All those things will help drive what their behaviours are and therefore can we help link that to, to our values. What we do when, when I'm training people on, on interviewing and how we, we get people to go through this is, is this is our PAL um, kind of methodology. It's like STAR and you've probably heard of STAR. Um, this adds in learning really so it's when we're asking people we're thinking about asking the question and it's like a funnel so you spend a lot of time at the top of this funnel um, trying to understand what the problem was. So tell me about a time when you had to solve a problem but you didn't have any data. And they give you a straightforward answer because maybe they've researched how to answer questions and it sounds great, but you, you can need to take a step back and say, okay, well, how are we, what's the problem? What's the size of the problem? What's the size of the data? How much data did you have? How much did you didn't have? And who was involved in the project? And what was your, your part in this? And then what did they do about it and what was the result? And then we go back to kind of learning. Like, what did you learn from that? Because if they didn't learn anything from it, then we can probably link that back to one of our, pre, our, of our values around um, humility or openness. And like, did they learn anything from that? What, what did they take away from it? So we, we, we train managers on being able to interview effectively, thinking about values, thinking about capabilities. Um, and then when we have our wash up, um, we try and bring it all together. 
So this is our, our talent matrix. It's a straightforward four-box grid. And what we want to do is try and plot these three candidates that we've interviewed into one of these boxes. Now, I guess it goes without saying that the yellow box, box three, means that this person is probably no use to us because they probably scored low on values and they've scored low on capability. So that's not right. But if we, say, plotted a couple of people on here, box two, so candidate number three, is high on capability, high on values, that's a really good fit. This is the person that we want to join our organization. Um, box one, where candidate one is, they're not quite there yet in being able to do the, the role. So you have a couple of um, options here. You either take this person on knowing that they could probably get there, um, and if you've got the time and the resource to be able to train someone up and help them get there, then that's, a, that's great, because chances are they're not necessarily, they, they wouldn't really go backwards in terms of kind of values and um, those sorts of behaviours, because people's values are kind of instilled at quite a young age. So that could be someone that you might want to take on. If you can't afford to help train somebody up, then that's probably someone for your talent pool. So make a note of this person and then contact them in a year or so later on, and they should have moved over towards box two, which is where you want them. I'd always recommend avoiding the green box because this person, and especially if that person was a bit further over as well in terms of capability or a bit lower down in terms of values, they could probably be very good at what they do, but how they do it is not necessarily the way you want them to do it. And these people will be disruptive. I remember working at a bank once and there was someone there and she was very good at her job. She was a program manager. She had lots of projects to implement. And she got them on time, but the destruction she kind of left behind her meant that people were leaving, I was always having to rehire for her, and she was more disruptive than helpful. Um, so I'd try and avoid people in that box there. So, um, unconscious bias. So we, we teach unconscious bias as a standalone uh, training module at King. It's mandatory for everyone to go through it. Excuse me. Um, but I put something into our interview training, which rolled out in January. We've got another session in, in two weeks, so it's, it's live. But we wanted to kind of make sure that someone who hasn't yet been on the unconscious bias training or someone that's going into interviewing who maybe did the module last year and probably forgot most of it, understands a bit more around unconscious bias and how it relates to recruitment. And I think this is, I, I find this subject really interesting. We have a pledge at King somewhere. Oh. Um, and we have this DNI pledge. So we, we remind people of the DNI pledge, um, and in terms of interview training, we talk to people about what unconscious bias is. <clears throat> I always tell people when you do presentations, don't read it, but I'll, I'll read it for the sake of us making sure we're on the same page. There's social stereotypes about certain people of individuals, um, and they're formed outside their own conscious awareness. So um, everyone has these unconscious beliefs. It doesn't matter if you say you don't, um, Joyce, who is our Director of Global Diversity and Inclusion, she says to me, I still have biases. So I'm from South London, I'll always get on with someone from South London, but I need to remind myself not to do that. This is her job, she's our Global Director of um, Diversity and Inclusion. She still recognises that she has um, biases. Um, and they come from one's tendency to organise social worlds by categorising. And I'll give you some examples of what, how that happens. Has anyone seen this before? It's called the Adelston Illustrator. You've seen it before because I've been here before, so you, you can keep quiet. Um, so the question is, is A or B darker or the same colour? So hands up if A looks darker to you. Fine. What, do you, what about if you think B is darker? Uh, what if you think they're the same? Yeah, you don't win anything. I'm afraid. You are right. So if you cover them up, you can see that A and B are the same colour. And now you're thinking, why? Because I can tell you, when I look at that, if I take those away, absolutely A looks darker. Um, and the reason it does is the way our, our brain thinks. Has anyone read Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow? I'd, I'd recommend it. It's, it's, it's really good. It's really interesting. Um, and he talks about these kind of two sides of the brain. Um, or these two systems of thinking. I'm not sure they're necessarily on one side or the other. System one is our, our doing part, is our unconscious part. I believe, if there are some extra bits coming up, no. System one is our, our doing side. Our, our, our brain processes something like 11 billion, million bytes of information per day, and that's the part of the brain that you need to act really fast and process information 
Um, if I was walking to the edge of the stage and I realised I was going to fall off, I haven't, I, my, my body's done it for me, it's realised, it was, it, was, it was unconscious, it just happened. System two is a bit more thoughtful, it's a bit more considered and measured, it takes more glucose to use that part of your brain, you're thinking about stuff, so if you were sat at your desk all day and you're doing some really intense, intense work, you will feel tired, not, not that you've been up and about or doing anything physical. Um, and the important bit about this for hiring is that when you're interviewing people, you want to be using your system two side more than your system one. So an example of using your system one would be, oh, I like what that person was wearing, or they had a football shirt on, and that's my team, so I probably like them, or, oh, I, I saw that they actually, they used to work for the same company, so they're probably, um, they're probably good. If you, meant, if you remember what I said previously about the kind of the, the definition of um, unconscious biases and stereotypes, you're popping people into categories because it's, it's easy, it's lazy, it's, it's your, you're using your intuition. But really, when you're interviewing, you want to be asking people questions. You want to be asking them um, to give you evidence of what they've done. And our, our jobs as interviewers is like a detective. Um, if you think of the wash-up as being the court that you come to, you need to come up with evidence. You know, the, the police don't turn up to a court case without evidence because they say, oh, I think he's done it because look at him, he looks really dodgy. And you can't say, oh, I think that person will be good at a job because they look good or I don't like the look of them. So we need to be using kind of system two thinking. And I'll give you some, some examples of a couple of biases. Does anyone know what these people have in common? Again, you can't answer. They're all dead. And the important thing here is like when they died. So they all died in 2016. And I don't you remember, 2016 was supposed to be this terrible year for celebrities dying. It was like, oh my God, oh no, not Alan Rickman and not David Bowie. And I think it was Christmas Day, poor George Michael died as well. And it was like, oh God, this is terrible. Um, and all it was was the media were perpetuating this, this thought, this confirmation bias that you, you start to have. So that as soon as someone dies in 2016, you go, oh, it's because they died in 2016. It's like you saying, I'm not going to hire someone from Amazon because I've heard they're not good, or I'm going to hire someone from Facebook because I've heard they've got good people. It's a confirmation bias. The trouble with this is that it's difficult to kind of categorise how fam famous someone is and to try and provide any kind of data around it. There's another example. Does anyone know what these people all have in common? Yes. Very good. So they all died at 27. So there's this confirmation bias that says, oh, it's, they died because they were 27, and everyone's hoping... How long until Justin Bieber's 27? Because we're hoping <laughs> it will all end. Um, and when you, you can actually find a bit of data behind this. I, I don't know how accurate it is. I Googled it, I found it. It, it managed to fit what I was trying to say. Um, but you can see there the age of people dying, quite a small percentage of their sample size was 27. Majority of people who were famous magicians died at 56. It's probably what you would ex expect someone to be a lot, a lot older. And all you're doing is taking all these preconceived ideas and sticking them into a box because it fits with what you, you already believe. And that's not what we want to be doing when we're, when we're interviewing. There's another one I mentioned around whether you like someone, you, you, you dislike them instantly. And you're to, what we're talking about is a similarity bias. Um, I spoke to someone recently, Alan Walker, who's not here, is he? I think I saw his badge out. And oh, is he? He's come over the pub. Okay. Um, and he he messaged me recently and said, um, can, "Can we can we do a podcast? And I want to chat. We can chat to you because we'll get on well because we're both bald and we've got beards. So if I was interviewing somebody and I've got two candidates and they're both very capable, and I think, actually, there's something about that person, this guy with a beard and these balls, or maybe he's got kids and we talked about that. That's just a similarity bias. And they're really useful in day-to-day -day society because it's how you kind of form your friends groups and you, and you, and also friends, friendships kind of develop when people have the same values and things like that. And the values bit is important, but the kind of similarity bias, making sure that you don't kind of stray away or you're just aware of it is, is I think, really interesting. Um, the next slide was, um, I got the idea from one of our, um, senior people in Barcelona, she studied psychology, and she said the best example of stereotypes was this. And I, and I love showing this slide, and it, I think it works better in the US if you know who Martha Stewart is. Um, <laughs> you've got bad boy Snoop there, who is all sorts of fun, and you've got the wholesome looking Martha Stewart, who's the only one who's a convicted felon. She did something dodgy with her uh, shares or something in the US and, and got charged. And when you think about when we're hiring, and certainly for us as a tech firm, um, we have a real big push this year. We want to hire 40% female for this year, and next year get to 50%. And then you have things like this, where 
you know, you've got TV shows and you're looking at a story about a startup and they're all men. And there are, there are some stats around the number of women compared to men um, in startups. And um, it's, it's kind of tough when you're trying to promote diversity and inclusion and you're trying to ex get people to come along on the journey with hiring for culture. But I think it's really important that we're kind of aware of it. I want to show you a, a quick video. And I'll be quick because I'm starting to run out of time. This afternoon, we're going to draw people doing different jobs. And the first job we're going to draw is a firefighter. Okay. Have a think in your head what a firefighter looks like. Oh, no. What's your firefighter called? Mine's called Firefighter Gary. Firefighter Stan. <laughs> firefighter Simon. He's big and strong. He's got a big helmet on. That's brilliant, isn't it? Next, we're going to draw a surgeon. Have you thought of a name for your surgeon? Jim Bob. Jim Bob. He's a brain surgeon. I think he would wear a stethoscope. He gives you medicine. That's his ambulance. OK, next, we're going to draw a fighter pilot. Yes. This is his jet plane. He rescues people. He likes to do stunts in the air and stuff. OK, now, who would like to meet these people for real? Yeah! Are you at the dress stop? My name's Tamsin and I'm a surgeon in the NHS. My name's Lauren and I'm a pilot in the Royal Air Force. My name's Lucy, I'm a firefighter in the London Fire Brigade. So who wants to know how to do an operation? Who's putting it on? Everyone I'm trying my stethoscope. Can we put this in here? What does it look like? There you go. Now you're a proper fighter pilot. So into your ears. Can you hear that? Yeah. It's really Mine's good. Much better, yeah, yeah, it's much better than my kids' Mine's one. Got so if you think you don't have biases, you, then you probably do. Um, you see how young people kind of come up with them. I did a talk at my son's school when he was about four, just on basic career stuff, and that's a tough audience, four-year-olds, because they don't sit still. Um, but they all guessed. I had a couple of pictures, and a picture of my friend Tamsin, who is in the fire, fire service in, in Worcester, and there's a little snapshot of just a head. Like, is she a, a hairdresser or a firefighter? And they all went, hey, she's a hairdresser. And four years old, that's what they think. They think people have certain job types already. Um, did anyone guess that that would be the outcome? Did anyone think, I know where this is going, he's tricking us, they're going to be women? And if, and if you did, it's, it's, it's probably because either you've guessed it or we're talking about this. So your, your system two brain is firing up a bit more, you're using that more because you're thinking, well, how is he going to trick us this time? I saw the thing with the coloured things. Um, I've done it before when I've done it at the beginning and in my basic test, fewer people have guessed that's what it is. So remember that you have these kind of two, two sides of your brain. There you go, 11 million bits of information, only 40 bits per second our system two can, can cope with. So how do you, how do you want to do this? Um, we, are, we are obviously wanting to hire the best person for the team. So there's two things you can, you can do. One is to get people to have these kind of nudges. Think about, well, what if this person wasn't this or they were, they were that? Like, what if, what if he was a she? What if they had a different accent? What if, I like this one, if they had a firm opening handshake? I think that's, a, that's an awful one, and I know people kind of judge people on it. Um, the other thing that I think is really useful to do to reduce biases is when you're getting people to do interviews, get them to think about the results that they want to hear. Like, what answers are you hoping for? Are you hoping for them to talk about this, this, and this? Because if they do, when they review their feedback, they're focusing more on the answers that they've got, not just, I've got three people and they've all had different answers and I'm going to then try and categorise them. That's a really good thing to do. Get the answers that you want out so people can assess it. So how, do you, how, do you, how can you do stuff, stuff like this? So if you have values, make sure you define the behaviours. Use those in, um, in interviews. Take them and write interview questions that relate back to those behaviours so that when you can come together, someone's not just saying, I don't think they're a good cultural fit or a good team fit. Because I've heard that for years and it's difficult to argue with, but you know that they just want another lad to play football with or you want another girl to do this or another person who, who fits in with them. Um, and you can really help avoid biases. Um, do some interview training. You know, it doesn't have to be 
fancy. It can be really basic, but get the basics in there, help people understand a bit about unconscious bias, get them to think about the outcomes they want. Um, like I said, these are our values. You, know, you could create little logos, you could just define them. It, it, wouldn't take that, it wouldn't take too long. We have interview sheets. These are our values. If somebody wants them, contact me. I'm happy to, to share them with you. So what's next for us? I'm realizing I'm running over a little bit. Tash, I'll be quick. Is that all right? Sure. Mm, you saw that look. So a couple of things for us, what we're doing next. Um, we're trialing something called Hire First. It's a bit like Hired, if you've heard of Hired. It's a bit like Tinder, if you've heard of Tinder. Basically, a candidate has to say they like you, and you have to say you like a candidate. But unlike Tinder, you don't get to see a picture or you don't see a name. You basically see some initials and their resume. And their resume will sanitize things like, obviously, their, their name and interests, and also formatting, because formatting varies across country. Um, we're just trialing this. That's really interesting. Um, we've now actually put in Textio. Um, I'm sure most of you know what Textio is. If you want to ask me afterwards, I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through. I can even show you on, on my laptop. It's, that's really useful for us to kind of getting gender balanced text um, and scores. And you can use it for your reach outs as well. Um, and we've been trialing ClickIQ, which is a programmatic advertising platform. So trying to push our ads out to more places. Um, it's actually starting to work really well in a couple of areas. Um, we have a certain amount of spend. You can see how much I've got left there. Um, setting up some ads, how much per click you want to put in, and it's driving traffic. The thing that we're struggling with, as I mentioned to Glenn earlier, is actually knowing really where it came from and tracking it perfectly. That's down to our ATS, not this, this system. 